Dobrý den. Good morning. My name is Teresa Svadoševa and my name is Jan Motal. Welcome to today's conference on ethics in documentary filmmaking. This is the second edition of this conference and we are glad to see you here. And we will briefly explain why we created this platform. Uh, I will continue speaking in Czech, but uh, in the next section I will start speaking English. Meanwhile, you can use interpreting. We created this platform because we were lacking a place where we could speak about ethics, especially in documentary filmmaking. It is a very broad subject. It can include reality shows or documentaries and TV formats. And we decided to speak about all this in this conference. This year's topic focuses on ethics in the context of found material, while last year's topic was the topic of power. This year we decided to choose several subtopics and I will not speak in much detail. We will start with the keynote speech. Then there will be a panel with academics, but it will be very audience friendly, so don't be afraid. It will not be too theoretical. It will just give you an introduction to this topic from the perspective of academia. Then there will be a lunch break and after that we will meet here again for a discussion. No, sorry. You will have lunch before the academic section and then there will be a master class with Sergei Loznica. It will be online, but I am sure you will enjoy it anyway. If you know him, you maybe know that he focuses on topics that have to do with history, especially the history of Eastern Bloc and Soviet Union and Ukraine. So it will be very interesting. And then there will be a panel debate with creators hosted by Andrea Slovakova. And today's program will end with a final discussion we use the title of Invasion Online because today when you are looking for footage you do not just have to go to an archive, you can open Facebook or Twitter or X, I'm sorry, and you just download footage. And this is exactly the topic of our last section. We might also touch upon the events in Ukraine and Israel. And this section will be hosted by Ivo Bystrychan. We will have Wojciech Bohač, Anna Krivenko and others. You can also enjoy refreshments here in this room and if you have any questions you can ask me because that is I won't spend the whole day here. Thank you for the floor. I hope that this conference is a place where we can speak all together so don't hesitate to speak up. So, yeah, Michael, you can leave your headphones. <laughs> um, I would like to introduce you our keynote speaker, uh, which is going to say something about the compilation film and present you some materials. I will just briefly introduce him if you do not uh, know who he is, but I think that most of you know at least his name, Michael Renov. Uh, he's a scholar of the documentary film. He has written several very important books uh, on this subject, and he holds the Haskell Wexler Chair in Documentary at the School of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California. And uh, uh, Michael is uh, as a vice dean of the school, if I have good information. And in uh, the year 1993, he co-founded Visible Evidence, a very interesting and important conference that brings together documentary makers from the whole world. So the stage is yours, Michael. I'm very pleased that you are here. Oh, 
my first task was to get up onto the stage. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's my first time to the Czech Republic, and so I'm uh, very honored to be, to be with you and uh, really appreciative of the invitation. So as Jan says, I I'm going to be talking about the idea of the compilation film. So if I could have the kind of the opening slide, please, from the PowerPoint. The subtitle, The Chorus of Bits and Pieces. Uh, next slide, please. John Grierson. This is a quotation from John Grierson, who is one of the founders of the documentary film form, the first person to ever use the word documentary to refer specifically to a film in a review of the film by uh, Robert Flaherty, Moana, 1926. So went on also to be an important producer of, and the founder of the British documentary film movement in the 1930s. This is what he wrote in uh, 1933. There was a quick cross-section of the American, un he's describing a film. There was a quick cross-section of the American unemployed. The picture flashed from one desolate figure to another, and the sound strip, in complement, picked up various bits of conversation revealing the lost hopes of the people in the bread queues. And now, call this the chorus of bits and pieces. The chorus of bits and pieces, it's the phrase that Gerson used to describe this very early compilation film. I've not seen it. I'm not sure it exists. It was entitled Three-Cornered Man, and it was produced in 1933. And, and it was a project that attempted to evoke for audiences that the level of despair that had descended on the land in the US in the wake of the Great Depression, the economic downturn. And it was a worldwide depression. This was the film that attempted to describe what the experience was by uh, showing these uh, various uh, scenes from uh, d diverse spaces. In the manner of other compilation films of its time, the account it offered of the devastating economic downturn was composed of extracts from an array of contemporary newsreel films. So it was all bits and pieces from, as, he would, as Grierson would say, from newsreel. If the newsreels offered present tense description of the crisis, Three Cornered Man stood at a greater remove from the specific scenes the footage contained, attempting, attempting via editing and narration a more analytical overview. Despite the apparent effectiveness of the film for audiences and from accounts of the time, it was effective, it had an impact. Grierson's brief description, the chorus of bits and pieces, and if you've read anything by Grierson, you'll know that he was an ideologue who had, an, had a sense of what documentary ought to be, and it wasn't a chorus of bits and pieces. That for him was, was a, a, a kind of a put down. And, and this idea stands in stark contrast to something else which would be familiar from classical aesthetics, and it's that notion of the Gesamtkunstwerk, which is the total or unified work of art. Examples, a Greek play by Aeschylus, or an opera by Richard Wagner. These were objects whose every part contributes to a kind of completeness, a, a, a straining towards perfection and a symmetry of the whole. What, by contrast, Next slide, please. What, what, by contrast, are we to make of this mongrel mediatic form, this ragtag thing we call the compilation film, and what place does it deserve in the history of the documentary film? So you see I'm setting up this idea between kind of classical aesthetics where there's a, an artwork and it's meant every piece, every part, every fragment should contribute to an overall symmetry and, and an overall uh, kind of unified work of art. And this is something quite different. 
So to begin to answer these questions, I, I want to put forward a provisional description of the compilation film and then offer some ideas about the central, about some uh, the several directions the cinematic approach has taken over the years and be more specific about a couple of films. So let me offer my tentative description here. A kind of working definition. The next slide, please. Composed of newsreel, archival, or found footage, the compilation film is generally deemed a special subset of the documentary. It is perhaps a second order documentary, one that depends on the existence of other prior creative treatments of actuality. That phrase, creative treatments of creative treatment of actuality is, you may recognize that as the thumbnail definition offered by no, no, none other than John Grierson. But I'm calling it a second order documentary. Contrary to our common perception, preconceptions of the nonfiction filmmaker as, let's call it an auteur, and that's borrowed of course from film studies thinking about makers of, uh, fiction film uh, in the history of 100 plus year history of, of cinema, we still think of documentary auteurs, I think. Um, so many of them are participating you know, in the conference today. But this idea of the compilation film is somewhat at odds, I would argue, with the notion of the auteur. The creator of the compilation film may in fact never shoot or supervise the shooting of a single foot of film, never record a single sound. I, I don't, no, don't know if you know the name um, Richard Leacock, or Ricky Leacock, very well known filmmaker from the period of direct cinema starting in the 1960s, passed away probably a decade ago or so, but he was known to say if, and I heard him say it on more than one occasion in speaking about being a documentary filmmaker, if you don't shoot, in other words, if you're not the guy behind the camera, you're not really a documentary filmmaker. That was his sense. So this, I, I would pose that the, the compilation film is, is at odds with that idea of the one who is the composer, the creator, the auteur. Uh, and how can it be that the one who doesn't lift the camera, the one who doesn't look through the eyepiece, the one who doesn't record the sound, how does that person become the director? Well, the, the work of the compilation, rather, is primarily the work of the edit suite in the repurposing of extant material through a selection process that gives new life and new meaning to that material, which is why I have this this uh, famous painting, uh, which is referenced in Anya Sfarda's The Gleaners and I. Uh, that wonderful film was made in 2000. The, the sense of the one who recycles and revivifies, brings new life to sounds and images. And that notion of the gleaner, of the one who repurposes, and I would say in our moment of environmental crisis, this idea of repurposing is very much uh, an important one and one that it has, has new meaning. And that is where the compilation film comes in. In some ways it's the most ecologically sound of all film forms. The compilation film is both very old and also new, very new. An example of the new. Um, given the growth and increasing accessibility of media archives, many of them online, th that provide a deep well of material for contemporary content, content producers. And here I'm thinking of the, the remix culture, the rip, mix, burn ethos of DIY culture. It is tempting to judge the compilation film to be aesthetically and philosophically in sync with emergent media culture. 
and I first wrote this a few years ago, and I think it's truer today than it was the day that I wrote those lines. Um, there's a, a, an organization called LA Film Forum, Los Angeles Film Forum. It's a cultural organization that's committed to screening experimental film and documentaries and animation and video art in Los Angeles. Uh, they began in 2009, I believe it was, a, a series of screenings that took the shape of, uh, of a festival, and it was called the Festival of Appropriation, or actually the Festival of Inappropriation, with the I-N in parentheses. So the Festival of Inappropriation. And their self-description offers insight into the philosophical underpinnings of the compilation film as well as its apparent contemporaneity. Next slide, please. So this was 2009, but it exists today and it's now been organized uh, by Jamie Barron who teaches at UC Berkeley uh, and it's still each year a new edition. So but this was the original kind of manifesto. Mashup, machinima, Remix, collage, compilation, found footage, detourment. These terms all refer to films and videos that tear materials from one context and place them in another constantly, questioning the limits of what is appropriate. At its best, this act of inappropriation may produce, may produce revelation that leads viewers to reconsider the relationship between past and present, here and there, truth and lie, intention and subversion. So what emerges from the festival of an appropriation manifesto is a sense of the very expansive horizon of possibility for the compilation film. Next slide, please. It is intrinsically dialectical and some would argue intrinsically cinematic in that it creates whole new worlds out of the endless archive of the already represented, mobilizing new possibilities for the plastic material. What Jay Lida, and I'll say more about Jay Lida in a bit, what Jay Lida called the squirming, seemingly formless larvae of newsreels. I think that's a wonderful phrase. These plastic materials, both sonic and visual elements, can be brought together to reveal the unexpected unexpected or inappropriate to put forward ideas, sometimes quite abstract ideas, or move us toward a particular point of view. In this way, the compilation film reveals rhetorical, epistemological, and aesthetic dimensions, leveraging the latency of the raw source material to create whole new worlds. This culture of remix and reactivation, I would argue, is the lifeblood of the YouTube generation. And yet the compilation film is also something very old. Recall that the masters of the Soviet cinema, among them Vertov, Eisenstein, Pudovkin, Dovshenko, argued in their several ways that the highest virtue of the cinema was to be achieved through montage. That is the studious, poetic, and potentially explosive intercutting or juxtaposition of filmic elements. Recall here Eisenstein's conjugation of montage into metric, rhythmic, tonal, and overtonal subtypes in his 1929 Methods of Montage essay. It was Eisenstein who famously wrote that cinematography is, first and foremost, montage, a statement that seems to grant primacy to editing over capture. So I think that's important when we think about the compilation film as something emergent, something new. It's really echoing something that was being argued in the 1920s very forcefully, and it's continued throughout the, the entire history of cinema and the study of it. Vertov, for his, uh, from his perspective, also wrote at length about the ways in which editing preceded shooting in his view, ideation, or pre-production, was itself a first instance of editing. 
Eisenstein was perhaps most explicit in his linkage of montage with dialectical thinking of a sort to which all good Marxists should aspire. He argued that the edit, the collision of images laid out on the editing table, could occur at the level of composition, that is, within the sign or image itself. Next slide, please. In the cinematographic principle and the ideogram, he references a decidedly pre-cinematic form, the hieroglyph, that combines separate elements within it in such a way as to produce an, an idea or concept. He displays on the page the hieroglyph for bark, a composite sign fusing both dog and mouth. Thus, at the level of the sign, dog plus mouth equals to bark. For the Soviets, cinematic creation was thought to be the result of the combustion of disparate elements, a process that could transmute the many parts into a coherent whole, a dialectical synthesis. It should come as no surprise then that a Soviet contemporary of Vertov and Eisenstein, Esther Schub, should be considered the progenitor and first master of the compilation film. But I, I just want to stress briefly the idea of montage being not just an aesthetic choice, but really a political one at the time. And I'm talking here in a country, and I'm very aware of the fact that there's a history here of uh, dialectician, uh, uh, dialectical, but also politicized thought and culture, which has not been a happy story. And so I'm, I, but I'm very, con I'm very conscious of the kind of the history behind these ideas about dialect, dialecticism, and uh, and to remind us all that Eisenstein, though he was very much in favor of the revolution, like all the artists of the time, suffered uh, at the hands of it. Nevertheless, for them, this was a political and and also philosophical concept that ends up being part of an aesthetic. So setting out, and, and back to Schub, this is Esther Schub, and one of the reasons I really enjoy thinking about her is because all these names that I'm mentioning from the 20s and 30s are male, and yet the person considered to be the great source, the first source of this idea of the compilation film is none other than Esther Schub. So setting out to create a cinematic testimony to the glories of the February Revolution in 1917, 10 years after the fact, so this was produced by commission in 1927 and was in parallel with what Eisenstein was doing in the making of October, Schub spent months searching through boxes of negatives and prints of random newsreel films stored haphazardly in the damp cellars of Soviet museums and film studios. Jay Lida uh, described Shub's process in his book, Kino, A History of the Russian and Soviet Film, and it's worth quoting at length. Next slide, please. There she is. This is what Lida wrote. More sensitively than Vertov and more carefully than any newsreel editor in the world, Esther Schub examined the whole archive of preserved newsreels frame by frame, finding the implications and connectives in each shot that only a skillful editor is trained to do. Trained primarily in the editing of 200 foreign fictional films and 10 Russian films, Schub gave the newsreel a new dimension. When in Follow the Romanov Dynasty, she brought back to life, or brought newly to an artistic dramatic life, footage that had hitherto been regarded as having at the most only the nature of historical fragments. By the juxtaposition of these bits of reality, she was able to achieve effects of irony, absurdity, pathos, and grandeur that few of the bits had intrinsically. So let me pause to say a little something about Jay Lida. This book uh, that he wrote in 1964, it was called Films Beget Films. And it was the first extended consideration of this idea of the film type that we're discussing here, the compilation film. 
so it's almost 60 years ago. At the time, Lida was teaching at NYU. He taught there for decades. And many of, he was a colleague of people like uh, Annette Michelson, for one, whose name may be known to you, but he was a, one of the bulwarks of cinema studies at NYU for many years. But his, he himself began as a filmmaker, and I encourage you, and you can find it on YouTube, but he, he made a film uh, called A Bronx Morning in 1931. He was 20 years old. And shortly, and it's kind of a wonderful city symphony, uh, but shortly after that, he made his way to the Soviet Union and lived there and studied and, and became acquainted with all the greats. And this is how that, the book that I quoted from, this quotation came from Kino, uh, which came out in the early 60s. But it was based on his, his life and his experience and his interactions with all of these people about whom he was writing that had occurred some 30 years previous. So he was an important American scholar who had an impact on generations of, of other film scholars and students through his work there uh, in New York City. So, uh, and I think, uh, Kino I think came out in 1961. And, and it, to my mind, it's the best book still of uh, the history uh, and kind of the, the Soviet era because it's told by someone who has first-hand experience as well as archival research. All right, so writing several years later in his monograph on the compilation film, Films Beget Films, love the title, Lida is succinct in his description of Shub's powers as cineast, her, ex her expertise forged from a background as an editor of the works of others. And for those of you in the audience who are more maker than scholar or theorist or whatever, I mean, I love the fact that Shub is somebody who brings the two together so well. Is she couldn't have been the maker of the work that she did had she not first begun as a practitioner, but also someone who delved in a deep way and had some important ideas that were as I say, quite influential. So uh, like that whole generation of the Soviets, there was not a very clear distinction between those who were the thinkers and those who were the makers. Theorist and, and practitioner were pretty much conjoined. Lida is succinct in his description of Shub's powers as cineast her expertise forged from a background as an editor of the works of others. I love this. Shub learned the power of scissors and cement in relation to meaning. It's a great one-liner, in my opinion. It'd be great on an epitaph, you know. Here lies Esther Shub, who learned the power of scissors and cement in relation to meaning. Through her careful review and assemblage of thousands of feet of film, shot by hundreds of cameramen, over many years, Shub created something entirely novel in this film of hers, Fall of the Romanov Dynasty, and it was a bit of an eye-opener, and it still is. And uh, in, in, in doing this, she created a crucial, she narrated, rather, a crucial swath of her nation's history with clarity and insight. So we have two quite brief clips, but just to give you an idea of what she was trying to do and what I think she accomplishes. If we could see these two brief clips to give you a flavor of what Shub was up to.
Okay, let me just stop there for a second because there's another clip too, but I just want to say something about this. So what she's doing, of course, and now in the aftermath, it's easy enough to see, oh, anyone could think of that, but she digs out from the from the depths of the archive, images of these uh, of the noble, the aristocrats dancing, you know, and really having a great time, and uh, probably working up a little bit of a sweat. And then she cuts to the people who are serfs, the people who have no access to capital. It's a feudal state at the at that time, and these were the people who were going to become part of that revolution that would change everything and give them a stake in a new world and a new, a new society. So she juxtaposes one kind of labor, which is a playful kind of thing, which maybe is making the heart race and even sweat. Then comes toil. And she wants to juxtapose that because she, why? Again, the di this is the dialectician in her is that she wants those two things to collide. She wants us to say, there are rich people and there are poor people. No. She wants to say there are rich people because there are poor people. And that they are in tension with one another. And they are in potentially collision with one another. And that's why you have to have the revolution. So that's how film language or aesthetics leads directly to a kind of political view of the world and makes her a good communist. And it's done by stitching together the work of others. Okay, so if, if there's that second clip, which I think now we'll sort of see the, the rhetoric heightening towards the end of the film. Because remember, she's celebrating on the 10th anniversary, this, the February Revolution. And on the soundtrack, of course, International. Not sure that's really Lenin. Don't think it is. I'm so conscious of the fact that this plays differently in the Czech Republic than it does in the U.S. I mean, I, there I was, you know, as a, when I was studying this stuff the first time, uh, you know, an, an avowed Marxist kind of guy, like most of my fellow students at the time, tail end of the Vietnam War, et cetera, counterculture, all of that. Um, but nevertheless, <laughs> Nevertheless, what she does by putting together those scenes from a great variety, and we have no idea, it's hard to say, how many different films she selected from or how many different newsreel uh, sequences she's stitched together. But the feeling here is to create a sense of inevitability and the kind of power and the build, a kind of dynamics that you create not from a single composition, 
but rather, you know, you see what I'm getting at, I think, which is to, to kind of bring together in a forceful manner. The music helps, the rhetoric builds, you get all caps in the English intertitles, but it's meant to happen uh, a kind of um, intrinsically through the, the build that's created by the cut. All right, so compilation film has evolved, of course. Yet, uh, as suggested by Lida, the compilation film has always been a film of ideas, despite the ends to, it, to which it's put, and these may include propaganda or simply self-expression. The compilation is both machine and miracle. And um, a, a quote from Lida from the 60-year-old book, the he calls it the mysterious process that transforms mere newsreels into documentaries. It reconfigures its source material, again, the squirming, seemingly formless larvae, to produce a work limited only by the imagination of its maker. Next, please. In Human Remains, 1998, San Francisco-based filmmaker Jay Rosenblatt turns to the archives to create a piece composed of five successive sections, each of them a profile of a great dictator of the 20th century, Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, Mao, and Franco. Such a project demands the recourse to the archive, although the images chosen tend, tend not to be the familiar or archetypal ones. In his retrieval of footage of these public figures, Rosenblatt selects selects the most informal backstage and behind the scenes shots in order to pierce the veil or public facade of the populist tyrants. And I really, I'm sorry um, that I do not have a clip to share with you. I don't think you know this film. And if you don't, there are certainly at least, if you go to YouTube, um, there are excerpts that you can see to get a sense of what he's doing because I think it's worth taking a look. So the images are coupled with a voiceover. This is the concept, Rosenblatt's concept is, first it begins, the voiceover starts in the native tongue of the dictator, so you know whether it's German or Italian or Russian, um, Spanish, Mandarin, what, whatever it might be. And then, the, and, and it's, for, it's always first person, and it seems to speak the protagonist's innermost thoughts in first person. So the voiceover plays out like an interior monologue from the point, first person perspective of, the, pers of the, uh, the dictator in question. So in this way, Rosenblatt stages an unaccustomed spectacle for the documentary audience. Let's call it an illustrated interior monologue. As we learned from the closing credits, the spoken texts are drawn from another archive the memoirs, letters, and private writings of, or biographies devoted to, each of the dictators. So he gives you a kind of a bibliography at the end. The voiceover and footage tend to function as roughly parallel, parallel tracks that supplement one another. Sometimes the images seem particularly illustrative of the interiority being voiced, although that specificity can also be an effect of editing. There are also occasions of apparent sync sound, most notably in an early sequence of digging. It sounds like the digging of a grave. The footage of the digging, degraded, grainy, slightly slow-mo, as though resurrected from a distant past, is accompanied by an apparent sync track that is, in its liveness and clarity, an uncanny mismatch for the images. A slightly foreboding musical score or ambiance is occasionally added. Notable in the film's opening shot of train tracks being traversed, the inexorable passage of cinematic time, imaged godlike from above. Recall that the compilation film, that chorus of bits and pieces, is by way of its character as second order assemblage rather than event coverage, a film of ideas. In Human Remains, much is evoked and in short order. The digging trope, 
deposits and excavation of the past and of infamous lives lived, suggesting that one of the film's themes may be historiography itself, the questioning of the ways that history gets written. Sometimes revelations rise up in startling ways from the gestures or glances contained in the footage. And when I say he mines or he excavates, that's what he's doing. Rosenblatt occasionally slows down or freezes the frame to offer emphasis or punctuation. In his adroit manipulation of time and gaze, Rosenblatt treats the footage in a manner somewhat akin to another contemporary compilation film artist who I'll mention shortly, Peter Forgatch. Forgatch is a masterful magician of home movies, and he's gonna be one of the participants this afternoon. Amateur and found footage who over a 40 year period has produced a series of startling works. Like Rosenblatt, and they know each other. Like Rosenblatt, Forgatch elicits revelations and responses far in excess and even at cross purposes with the original material. That's always important to say. So it's not just linkage, it really is often a kind of combustion. So to, to undercut the original intent, especially for the material that he's able to find about these dictators is, uh, I challenge you to find any archival footage that would seem to have one ounce of criticism of someone like uh, Hitler or Mussolini because they're all made by, they're, it's all perpetrator footage. But he's managing to undercut it by the voiceover and the voiceover is always drawn from these texts that are uh, historical texts and some of them would seem to be almost diaristic as though it's these people, these dictators, uh, telling, giving us access to their interiority. The work of makers such as Rosenblatt and Forgetch reminds us that the editor's eye is always in service of the dialectician's brain. Okay, so on to a, a little bit about Forgetch. How many of you know the work of Peter Forgetch? Not many. Great, you're in for a treat. Well, I hope. He's uh, sometimes feisty in these social settings, but he's a very good artist and a very smart guy and a dialectician. So anyway, Forgetch's working methods. Since the early 1980s, this Budapest-based visual artist has collected amateur and home movie footage from a variety of sources. Forgetch's originating insight was that the Hungarian experience under communism was largely inaccessible through the official accounts. I'm guessing this is familiar terrain for you guys. The Sovietized, the top-down view of history. He didn't trust it. And um, you know, Forgetch himself uh, did not do well growing up under communism. And I'm not, I don't think he would mind if I mentioned that he was thrown out of school. You know, he was in, in art school and he just, he wasn't a good communist. Far better to approach an understanding of mid-war and post-war social life in Hungary and elsewhere by way of the amateur footage which depicted the rituals of everyday life, the banality of street scenes, family gatherings, and life cycle events. So began Forgetch's obsessive image gathering. The found footage, archival images, and home movies he collects are the raw material for his excavations of the past. So again, the name of his original series was called Private Hungary. That was the insight. You don't trust the, the official history. You look elsewhere, bottom up rather than top down. So family films are more likely to be a place to find meaning and to make sense of what the experience of living under communism was during that period. But his other films deal with other moments and other contexts besides Sovietist Hungary. Next uh, slide, please. But it would be incorrect to imagine that Forgetch is more historiographer than artist. I do not want to suggest that. His extensive oeuvre, and he's produced something like 40 films, 
he's kind of a workaholic, is rigorous in its fidelity to certain structural and aesthetic principles. The films contain almost no footage shot by Forgatch, but consist of meticulously edited, indeed reorchestrated archival material that may be temporally manipulated and even tinted. In this way, Forgatch signals his disinterest in a pristine retrieval of the past. He, he has, in, in every case, collaborated, not in every case because they don't work together anymore, I don't think, but for a period of time, he worked with this one composer, a pretty well-known uh, Hungarian composer, Tibor Zemzsa, whose remarkable scores or sonic scapes place the soundtrack on equal footing with the visuals. These are films to be heard as well as seen. The encounter with history occurs by way of the often degraded images, but also through the haunting instrumental and vocal arrangements. And in this way, Forgetch's films emerge as more meditative vehicles than authoritative documents of a past time. So I want to suggest that phrase, meditative vehicles. If we had more time, I would unpack that a little bit, but I'm not. I'm just going to say it. So it might be said that, that Forgatch is the creator of compilation films. I'm not sure that he would say that, but I'm going to say it. He's certainly a master editor. And in the Maelstrom, the film of his that I have written about the most and that I admire the most from 1997, the rescued images are imbued with uncanny historical resonances through a stunning display of decoupage. The footage is displayed at varying speeds and with frequent freeze framings that arrest gestures and glances, suspending the ine inexorability of time. Jemja's aff affectively charged choral and instrumental phrasings impose a shifting tonality. The superimposition of graphic text or voiceovers explicitly quoting laws, public decrees, and pub political speeches of the period provides a progressive timeline and precise historical matrix. We, the audience, as we watch this film, The Maelstrom, know perilously more than the image's makers. We cringe with, because remember, this is home movies from the period, from these people themselves. We cringe with dread knowledge as we watch a Dutch Jewish family, the Parabums. Uh, the guy in the Getting Married is our filmmaker, Max Parabum. Simon Parabum, the youngest of the three sons, is the upper right. We are moved. So we, we watch this family, the Parabums, embark on a Parisian holiday the day before Hitler marches into Poland. We are moved by the spectacle of Jewish worship at Amsterdam's Rappenburg Synagogue, a tableau of a 1,000-year-old tradition of European Jewish life soon to be destroyed. And we are stricken by the sight of the family, Max, his wife Annie, her stepmother, their two small children, sitting around the table, sewing and packing, making last minute preparations just prior to their departure to Auschwitz. As we watch, a female voice recites the list of personal articles to be allowed each de deportee, a mug, a spoon, a work suit, a pair of work boots, two shirts, a pullover, two pair of underwear, two pair of socks, two blankets, a napkin, a towel, and toilet articles. In this intonation of the details of the everyday, Forgetch brings us face to face with Hannah Arendt's banality of evil. This summons from the Jewish Emigration Office with its promised relocation to labor camps is a rhetorical ploy to placate those being mobilized for the final solution. The cheerful resolve of the parabooms in these last images testifies to that tactic's success. And this home movie footage has been resurrected. It's part of the film, and it comes towards the close. So this last scene best illustrates what I take to be Forgatch's achievement. 
at the 57 minute mark for a 60 minute film, we are privy to what feels like the final moments of European Jewish family life. It's a, an, an historical spectacle that is both general and particular. The Hungarian Marxist critic Georg Lukács once wrote that the goal for all great art is to provide a picture of reality in which the contradiction between appearance and reality, the particular and the general, the immediate and the conceptual, is so resolved that the two converge into a spontaneous integrity. The maelstrom approaches that goal, in my view, evoking the fate of the 120,000 murdered Dutch Jews through the detailed depiction of one family in extremis. Max Paraboom's camera records his wife, his mother-in-law, his daughter, <coughs> excuse me, nothing more. These images are limited by an all too imperfect knowledge of events about to unfold. But Forgetch has prepared the way for the metonymic leap to the world historical, craftily expanding the historical canvas along the way by counterposing to the Paraboom material, material scenes of Crown Princess Juliana's wedding, amateur footage of a National Socialist Youth Storm Camp, and of a Dutch Nazi training camp in Turborg. Finally, and with increasing frequency, Vorgatch interweaves, oh dear, the home movie footage of a second family, that of Artur Seyss Inquart, an Austrian Nazi party minister appointed Reich's commissioner for occupied Dutch territories. So I'm gonna, I think I'm running low on time here, so I'd like to go directly to the next slide, which I think should be an embedded clip from the Maelstrom, because it's important to kind of feel wh what that result is. Onderzoek en geneeskundige keuring. Naar het doorgangskamp Westerbork, station Hooghalen, begeven.
verschillende bewijs- en persoonspapieren en distributiekaarten. Met inbegrip van de distributiestamkaart. Mogen niet bij de bagage verpakt worden. Toch moeten voor onmiddellijk vertoon gereed medegedragen worden. De woning moet ordelijk achtergelaten en afgesloten worden. De huissleutels moeten worden medegenomen. Niet medegenomen mogen worden de levende huisraad. Oké. Okay. Next slide, please. I'm closing. So in what I've said here, I have hoped to offer at least a preliminary introduction to the compilation film, its defining characteristics, and a sense of both its historical roots and its dynamic currency within the media sphere. It is an elusive and licentious cinematic form, one that draws upon all that has been recorded previously rendering shards and fragments into new unities, obsessively reframing, destabilizing, resurrecting, negating. Next slide, please. It is perhaps both parasitic and progressive for its unstinting attention to the recycling of all the images of the world. In it, no recorded sound or image remains beyond reclamation, achieving in dramatic fashion what Siegfried Krakauer once called the redemption of physical reality. Thanks. I'm sorry this took longer than it should have, but I hope there's time for questions. Okay, yeah, thank you for your very informative uh, presentation. Uh, a lot of very inspiring uh, thoughts, but we have, I think that we have five, five minutes for some questions. If you have questions, Michael, please raise your hand. And questions you or comments or observations yeah. or points of disagreement or... Yeah, thank you, yeah, all, all of this. All of those. <laughs> Yes, I will give you a microphone. Thank you so much for such an important and meaningful lecture. Um, so my comment and question is toward uh, Peter uh, Foggett's film. Um, one thing I found that so poignant is that the audience know what happened but not the subject. So how can we, I mean, to analyze that in terms of the uh, decision making, were you able to give us more guidance for that? Which is fascinating that we know, but the subject did not know. Yes, yeah. thanks. So I'm so glad that that was your comment and your question because it really helps to link with ethics. Because this is a real ethical concern. You, one, one has to admit, the person who is the the filmmaker, artist, editor, takes on a role that usurps a role as sort of co-maker. becomes, I, I feel that Forgetch becomes a collaborator with Max Paraboom, who's been murdered. Max doesn't have, right? Max goes to Auschwitz and he's killed. He, he doesn't have the opportunity to say, Peter, go ahead. Finish the film. Make do what you will with my film. He can't offer that legal release. So ethically speaking, it's a very it's it's a it's a tricky situation. 
and because you're speaking for others who can't speak for themselves. And so you could say that's what in the Jewish tradition would be called a mitzvah, meaning it's a sort of a commandment, it's an obligation, it's a blessing. On the other hand, you could say it's usurpation. And you could say no one gave you the right. But that is in a way, so, and that is true for this film with the Maelstrom. It's very charged material. But it's true for virtually, I hate to speak for the artist, and he'll be around to speak for himself, I think. Uh, but it happens in almost all the films of resurrection, of home movie footage, or other archival materials. You, you, you're, you're taking someone else's voice and you're, and you're um, not only you're taking their image, but in the case of the fellow filmmaker, you're taking their, their own idea of what they would have done with the material. And so I think that's ethically difficult, but ethics comes back down to a kind of relational thing. It's like, how do I think of myself in relation to you? To what extent is there a kind of mutuality or reciprocity? I'm putting you and me on the same footing, it's impossible with a dead author. And it's impossible for the uh, compilation film generally because often these are authorless texts. These are newsreels. This, these are things that you're gonna grab from the internet. And you don't really know the source. And you can't ask permission. You take it upon yourself. And so I think it's ethically, I'm gonna use the word again, charged. I think this kind of appropriation is always ethically charged for that reason especially in the case of dead people, people who've been murdered. Uh, thank you, and I would like to just to add that uh, you can ask Peter Forgach uh, on the same question uh, this afternoon because he is going to join us uh, in our discussion later. So, And this discussion is going to be about uh, the using of found footage of private videos, etc., cetera, in, uh, in movies. Uh, I will give you opportunity to ask another, maybe the last question. So, yeah, just... Oksana! Yeah, I, so please, please give, uh, give her microphone, Teresa. Please raise your hand so Teresa can, yeah. And just, just a very, very brief uh, remark from mine uh, to, to, this, uh, uh, to this topic. I'm, I was thinking about the difference between uh, found footage of victims and... Uh, um, material uh, depicting the power uh, holders of power, because I think that this is this is different. Because when you are in power, like you are Hitler, <laughs> or or you are politician, or some some public uh, public personality, I think that there, from my point of view, there is some kind of that you you should know that you will be used uh, by by other people. That there is difference. But when you are in your private home. Yeah, true. And in the U.S., there is a big distinction legally drawn between public figures mm -hmm. who don't have a right of privacy as the average person. But I love the fact that Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco, etc., that they can have their images repurposed to undercut their their own intent and supremacy. Uh, so I think you know the filmmaker has that power, that right. Uh, to use as she will, or, yeah. yeah. But Oksana, yeah. I'm yeah. dying to hear Ask. what you have to say. <laughs> yes, um, thank you so much, Michael. It's always such an inspiration to, to listen to you. And uh, I know that the time of this talk is limited, but I really loved how you um, made references to another important figure, even without naming her uh, so clearly, and this is Agnes Sparta. Of course, and the idea of gleaning and gleaners and, and compilation is very much also at the heart of a lot of her work. So I would like to maybe ask you to uh, comment a little bit on her take on compilation because she's one of those rare filmmakers who are really able to put together multiple voices and, and think about social structures and the multiplicity of perspectives, as opposed to maybe Shub, who's really using the compilation as political weapon uh, in many ways, but we also have other ways of, of thinking about compilation to preserve the polyphony and to preserve the, the kind of uh, very sociographic take on, on um, the, the context explored in the film. Thank you. Wow, thanks. Yeah, those are two, like think of them as rhyming figures. 
Shub and Varda, right? And they, they are at cross purposes in many ways. One is rhetorically very focused, extremely focused. She's a, she's a believer, you know, she's a believer in the revolution until she's not. Uh, Varda, on the other hand, to go back to ethics, I mean, I think she's one of the most ethically important figures of uh, contemporary cinema. She passed a couple of years ago, but she's left a great legacy behind. And if it's true that ethics has to do with that sense of mutuality, of reciprocity, of setting up a, an important relationship that binds together the one on this side of the lens and the one on that side of the lens, the subject, the author, that there is a, a kind of um, openness towards the subject and, and, a, and, a, and a kind of vulnerability, a shared vulnerability. I, I think that's really important for how uh, Varda's work functions and the way that she can take from many sources. Because there's one thing that I think always exists in the way that she works with material. It's stuff that she's shot or things that other people may have shot. Um, there's always a, 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 a great awareness and a sensitivity to the people, to the animals, right? She's not just about the people, she's with about the cats and she's about the other living creatures. There's an openness and a kind of a dialogue and a dialogic sense that she's in, in a kind of conversation and, and in, a, in an exchange with those whom she films and those who are the kind of plastic material, which sounds very dehumanizing, but in her hands it becomes very alive and it becomes a very uh, sensitive to the personalities and, 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 the, and the uniqueness of each and every person she encounters. And so um, that's absolutely at cross purposes with the streamlined rhetoric of let's celebrate 10 years of the revolution. But I mean, thank you. Thank you, and I, I especially like your term, shared vulner vulnerability. This is really, mm -hmm. for me, inspiring for thinking about documentary ethics, because we were discussing uh, documentary ethics with students of uh, film schools uh, this, uh, this morning. There is several key keywords we have generated, and there is communication, cooperation, trust, personal sustainability, authenticity, all for me is about vulnerability, about sh sharing, sharing our limits. And we have the very last question, please. Uh, hi, uh, this is rather a follow-up question on your previous answer to the very first question. Uh, I wonder, uh, do you think there should be a kind of a established set of rules how to appropriate, reappropriate? material so that it's not kind of stolen in a way that uh, you, you, you were talking about asking for permission which might not be possible in certain cases but you know from and I'm speaking from the side of an academic who who's uh, insists or who's teaching about how to properly reference uh, texts in mm -hmm. writing should something like that be also an established practice in for compilation filmmakers who, who you know to always give their sources references at least at the end which is i think not that much done yeah in, in reality well um we could be here for so much longer <laughs> but this is why i I'm so glad I referenced the Jay Rosenblatt film, Human Remains, because he's one of those people who does meticulously include a kind of works cited or bibliography at the end of, of many of his films, including Human Remains. But I'm gonna take a slightly different approach. I, I, I heard that last year's guest um, was Patricia Alfterheide, who would take a very different stand than mine. And I was just at a conference, visible evidence conference last month. We were on the same panel on ethics. And we disagreed quite vocally and open. I mean, we're friends, but we disagree. She's one who believes that there ought to be some sort of codification. Why? Because she, I think, it's because her sort, 
Her beginnings were more in journalism. And in journalism, it's got a longer history. It's more, um, it's become uh, codified, I think, in terms of having certain protocols. But what I always disagree on is in the realm of art, I just don't think you write laws. Because another way of thinking about this would be to say that, and, and I think Varda helps us, because we could, theft would be one word to use, and another one would be revival, revivic revivification, uh, restoration, like you, the giving of new life, because you're plucking it from one context and you're putting it in another. And it's almost like, think of it as molecules. Think of it as something that happens in a place of combustion, a catalyst. Uh, it's not the original. It becomes something different in the hands of the author or the artist. So uh, I think we have to give license. I think we have to also be thoughtful and conscious. And back to shared vulnerability is I think the artist should feel vulnerable to the charge of theft. But that should not be held back from this creation through um, new combinations. Because I think Eisenstein was right. It's like how do you get to bark? <laughs> you take dog and mouth and you get to bark. And so I'm sorry dog and I'm sorry mouth, but together you make bark. And I wanna leave the artist the chance to create the hieroglyph in that sense. Having said that, I think there, we all should feel responsible. We all should feel that we have a charge upon us and that a duty of care, and, and that's true for all documentary, and all documentary making. And the duty of care is not just about, I won't tell a lie about you. It's also, I won't steal from you without thought, intentionality, and possibly citation, but I just don't, I just don't feel comfortable holding you know, a gun at the throat of the artist. I just think it, would, it makes for bad art. Yeah, thank you. Um, and maybe, maybe just uh, if you can, Michael, the very last uh, sentence from you. Sure. Because you, you told us that compilation film is very, how to say it, analogous or uh, it is very close to, to YouTube culture, remixing culture. Mm -hmm. So for me now it is question, where is the, where is the border? between explo exploding other lives in my YouTube videos and doing art? Mm. For you, I mean, personally, yeah. because, yeah, this is a philosophical question. Yeah. Hey, I talk a good game, but I do, I just, I'm not a YouTube kind of guy. <laughs> I honestly have never, my students don't believe this, I've never gone to TikTok. And I'm so proud of it. I, I know it's false pride. But I'm just, that's not for me, you know? I'm, I'm just a different generation, and so it's, I, I, don't, I don't align myself with it. But uh, I, I don't know, I think we have to be open. We have to be open. And then we will also have our own predilections and tastes. And so uh, I tend to be a little squeamish, you know, about that rampant theft. But I think when artists do something interesting and good and they bring new forms to life, I'm all for it, I applaud it. But out in the open public space, I think it's poorly used and, um, and it may be damaging. So now I've come out as the conservative that I truly am. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you for this and thank you for your presentation. And for the audience, we will continue at 1 p.m., meaning in 45 minutes here.